Okay, thank you. Can, can all those at the back hear me? Okay, good. So, thank you very much for coming for my session. So, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about developing killer Apple Watch applications. So, uh, just have a show of hands. How many of you have an Apple Watch on, on your hand? Wow. <laughs> and who has got a 10K, uh, the 18K watch? <laughs> I want to talk to you. <laughs> okay, so uh, how many of you have actually started writing apps for your, for your Apple Watch? And, and I, I guess you have already updated to Watch OS 2.0. Yes? Okay, if you have not done that, please do that. Um, it, it has got a lot, a lot of wonderful features. So, and, and that, that's my topic or, or, or the topic of, of my talk. So, um, as usual, please go to the app and, and give us your feedback. So a little bit about myself, uh, I'm focused on mobile training. So I do a lot of uh, iOS and Android training. And I'm also into wearables uh, training like Android Wear as well as Apple Watch. Um, I have uh, actually written a book uh, called Learning Watch Kit Programming. And the really sad thing about that was uh, by the time the book was released in the market, it was already outdated. So the reason being, uh, in, in June, Apple announced the new version of uh, the Watch OS, which is Watch OS 2.0. And the first book on the left was based on Watch Kit 1.1, uh, 1.x. 1. 1, uh, 1. So, um, so my editor said, hey, never mind, let's uh, update this book to second edition. So uh, the one on the right uh, would cover Watch OS 2.0. And that is going to be available end of this year, December. Um, I've just submitted my, my manuscript last night. So. Uh, if everything goes on without any problems, you should be able to see the book. And all the demos that I'm going to talk about today can be found on this book. So you know what to do, right? So uh, Anyway, um, all the demos uh, for, for, for this session, I'm, I'm, uh, I've already posted on, on, my, on my website. So I'm going to give you the link, and you can actually go and download all the source code. You just need Xcode 7. Uh, you don't need to have an Apple Watch. But since I think most of you have an Apple Watch, uh, you, you can actually deploy that onto your Apple Watch. OK, so the agenda that we want to cover for the next 15 minutes. So I'm going to get you started with Apple Watch uh, development. I think some of you are already familiar with that. So just bear with me for a while uh, while I, I get the rest up to speed. And then we can talk about some of the new cool features in the latest version of the Watch OS. And we'll talk about the new stuff available in the Watch OS uh, 2.0. Uh, they are complications, the Watch Kit connectivity framework, and you can download all the demos from this website. So if you want to copy down, you can copy down, or you can download the slides for, for, for this session, and then everything is there. OK, so let's talk a little bit about smart watches. Now, uh, I know that most of you are, are, are Apple Watch users. How many of you are actually Pebble Watch users? How many of you have Pebble Watch? Are you serious? <laughs> That's OK. Um, how about Android Wear? OK, one. Uh, come on, don't be shy. OK, only one. So OK, I shall not ask the third question. So, so I, I think all the rest are Apple Watch users. Now. Uh, I always get this question. So people always ask, who will be the winner uh, of this race for the wearable, uh, this device that's going to be, um, that you're going to wear on the wrist? So, well, I I'm not going to ask you because since you're in this session, you, you, your answer will be Apple Watch. So, but my, my thinking is, whoever controls the smartphone platforms controls the smartwatch platform. It's quite obvious because if you talk about smartwatches today, the smartwatch is still very much dependent on your mobile phones. So whatever mobile phones you have, chances are you will buy the device, the watch that comes from the same platform as the phones that you have. So if you look at the um, chart here, on the right you have Apple Watch, and behind Apple Watch you have the iOS platform, which is one of the uh, number one uh, in terms of market penetration, and then followed by the one in the middle, 
uh, you have the Android Wear, which is supported by Android, which is from Google. And on the left-hand side, you have your Pebble. Now, Pebble is in a very dangerous position now. Uh, why? Because they don't have a platform to support them. So in order for your Pebble watch to, to make any sense, you have to rely on either the iPhone or the Android. And if you read the news lately that when, when Pebble submitted their ab updated applications for iOS, Apple took a long time to approve. So they are at the mercy of uh, either Google or, or, or Apple. So, um, so I, I think from this chart, it, it is quite obvious in, in, in the long run, which are the winners in the wearable space. But anyway, since we are, we are talking about Apple Watch, uh, we should focus on Apple Watch today. Now, for developing on the Apple Watch, you need Xcode 7. And you should be familiar, already be familiar with iOS development. So uh, how many iOS developers are there in this room? I, I, I think all, almost, OK, who, who doesn't develop on iOS? OK, OK, so this is a good group for me to, to, to convert. So hopefully, after this session, you can rush out to buy an Apple Watch. Now, uh, in terms of language, you can use either the new Swift language, or if you have a very high threshold for pain, you can use uh, Objective-C. So uh, my, my, my suggestion to you is that if you are starting out on iOS development, I think Swift is a, is a good language to get started. OK? So those of you who, who actually laugh at that, uh, you, 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 you can ask them. Uh, how much pain they have went through uh, learning Objective-C. Is that right? OK, maybe wrong group. So maybe you guys uh, eat Objective-C for breakfast. So, OK, a little bit about the uh, Apple Watch specifications. So it runs on a custom chip from Apple. So Apple uh, designed their own chip for the Apple Watch. And it has got many sensors. So it has got a heart rate sensor on the back of the watch, which you can use to, to measure your heartbeat. And it has got accelerometer. It allows you to, to measure whether you are walking enough, exercising enough, or it is time to, to stand up. Uh, it has got Wi-Fi, so that if your watch is out of range of, from your phone, it can connect to well-known Wi-Fi networks, and then it can actually connect to the internet and, and communicate with the web services directly. Uh, it also has got Bluetooth low energy, but in terms of programmability of Bluetooth low energy, it is limited to communications between the watch and the phone. So we'll talk more about that as we, as we go along. And it is charged wirelessly using a magnetic charger. So a typical charge can last you for about a day. So uh, if you have not updated your watch to watch OS 2.0, Typically, that will last you for about eight, nine hours on average. But if you update to watch OS 2.0, um, the battery's lifespan is able to last you for about 14 to 15 hours, which is pretty imp impressive. OK, so it's time to upgrade. Now, in terms of interacting with the Apple Watch, there are a few ways in which you can interact with the Apple Watch. And the first is your digital crown. So digital crown is the, the little knob by the side of the, the watch, which allows you to, to turn, and you can use it to scroll through a list of items. Uh, you can zoom in and out of images. And it also acts as a home button. So when you press that, it actually returns you back to the home screen. And you can also use force touch on the Apple Watch. So force touch uh, is getting very common nowadays. If you have an iPhone 6S or 6S Plus, you know what is force touch. So uh, it first started out on the Apple Watch. And by pressing hard on the screen, you can actually initiate a, what we call a force touch. It's very similar to a, a, a right click on, on the desktop. And it has got this taptic engine, which provides haptic feedback. So when you scroll through a list, when you reach the top of the list, it will give you a, a little sort of vibration to tell you that, hey, you have actually reached the top of the list. And when you have messages coming in, you have notifications coming in, there are different types of feedback, uh, kind of vibrations that, that allows you to distinguish between one notification from another. Okay. 
Now, in Watch OS 2.0, uh, you can programmatically access the Taptic engine, which means that if you want to, to in, your, in your application, you want to have certain kinds of vibration, you can actually programmatically activate that. So that's something cool in Watch OS 2.0. Now, in terms of uh, Apple Watch sizes, um, good news, at this moment, there are only two sizes, at least to the developers. You know what I mean? So uh, there are two sizes. The first size is the 38 millimeters, and the other bigger size is the 42 millimeters. And like I said, good news, no auto layout. Those of you who have done iOS programming, you know auto layout is a pain in the back. Yes? So no auto layout yet. OK? So don't ever go and talk to Apple and say that you want a different size of watch. Because if you want different sizes of, of, of the Apple Watch, one day they will implement auto layout on your Apple Watch. And your nightmare will, will, will move from your mobile platform to your watch. Okay, so, so who actually enjoys auto layout? <laughs> let's, let's continue. <laughs> so I really suspect you guys write Objective-C code. <laughs> okay, now let's talk a little bit about the WatchKit uh, app architecture. So at this moment, your Apple Watch application is still reliant on your iPhone for connectivity. So on the left, you have your containing iOS app. And on the right, you have your watch app. And in your watch app, you have two components. First, you have the watch kit app. You have the watch kit app. And in the next slide, I'm going to elaborate on what are the things that you have in a watch kit app. Now, Besides the WatchKit app, you also have the WatchKit extension. So this is the place where you have all your Swift files, your code. And in the WatchKit app, this is where you have your Storyboard. So uh, good news is your knowledge in Storyboard is very much applicable when you develop Apple Watch apps. So now, let's elaborate on the previous slide in more details. So if you look, take a look at the diagram here, this is for Watch OS 2. So on the left is your iPhone, and you have your iOS app that accompanies your, your Apple Watch app. And on the right, you have your Apple Watch app. And in the blue box, you have your what we call your WatchKit app. And you have your storyboard as well as your resources. That is where you place all your UI and where you place all your resources, like your image files, HTML files, for example. And you have your logic, which is encapsulated in the yellow box here, known as the WatchKit extension. The WatchKit extension is where you write your code, uh, be it Swift or, in your case, Objective-C. Okay? Now, uh, the reason for, for highlighting this particular slide is because in the previous version of WatchOS, which is WatchOS 1.x, this WatchKit extension is actually on this side here. And so that means that whatever things you interact with your Apple Watch gets executed on the iPhone. So in, in the first version of Apple Watch, you got this problem. You, you run an app on, on the watch, you tap a button, it has got to make a connection to the phone, the phone executes, get the result, send it back, over to this guy. So the, the major complaint about first generation Apple Watch is that the performance is really sluggish. It's really slow. So in 2.0, they actually moved this onto the Apple Watch. And at the bottom layer here, the WatchKit framework basically communicates between these two devices using Bluetooth low energy. You don't have to get your hands dirty with Bluetooth low energy. Everything is done transparently for you. So this is how your Apple Watch interacts with your containing iOS app. Now, when it comes to deploying your applications, you deploy your iOS bundle. So this is your iOS bundle. You have your iOS app, you have your WatchKit app, as well as your WatchKit extension. So you deploy this as a single unit. So 
Uh, that means that today, if you want to develop an application for the Apple Watch, you must first of all have an iPhone app. So the user would have to go to the App Store, download your app, install that onto your, your iPhone. Only then would the Watch app be installed onto your Apple Watch. Okay. Now, what are the different types of Apple Watch applications that we can develop? First of all, we can develop native apps. So I'm going to show you a, a demo of a native apps uh, in a moment. So in Watch OS 2.0, in your native apps, you can actually access the accelerometer. You can access the Taptic Engine. You can play video files. You can do voice input. You can do text input. Okay. So this is what you can do with native apps. You can also write complications. We will talk about complications uh, later on. So, but for now, what are complications? Uh, complications are basically apps that supplies data to be displayed on the watch faces. So later on, I have a set of slides talking just about um, complications. So we will come to that in, in a moment. We will talk about notifications. You can also develop notifications. Now, by default, in your Apple Watch app, you don't have to do anything to support notifications. Whenever your iPhone receives a notification, it will automatically be sent to your Apple Watch if your iPhone is in a sleep state. But if you are using your iPhone, when the notification comes in, your notification will go straight to your iPhone. So by default, you don't have to do anything. But if you, it, it, as an application developer, you want to beautify your, your notification messages, you can also write applications that support notifications. You can also write what we call glances. So glances are basically information that shows the state of your application. And the users can actually take their watch, swipe from the bottom of the screen, swipe to see the latest state of your application. So if you want, you can also write applications that support glances. So later on, I'll show you a demo of what is a glance. OK, so for the benefit of those who are new to Apple Watch development, I'm going to run, run through a, a um, Hello World application. And then we will move on to talk about complications and as well as watch connectivity framework. Now, for Xcode 7, you can straight away select application under the watch OS category. And in this case, select application, select iOS app with watch kit app, and give it a name. So hello, Apple, watch, uh, fill in the rest of the, the stuff. What language you want? Say again. Objective C, very good. Swift. <laughs> now, uh, if you look at the bottom here, you can actually support notifications. And that is to say, if you have your Apple Watch application written, and when a notific notific notification comes in, you can actually format the notifications nicely so that you can display in the manner that you want. For now, we are not really interested in that. We're going to uncheck every one of them, uncheck this, and then click Next. And we're going to save it onto our hard drive. OK. Now, if you look at the left-hand side, this is your user suspects, your app delegate, your view controller, your main dot storyboard. So this is your containing iOS app. So nothing really interesting to see here. Now, if you look at this site here, you have your WatchKit app. You have your WatchKit extension. Remember the slide that I showed you just now? Under the WatchKit app, you have your interface.storyboard. If you click on this, you see something very familiar. You see your good friend here, your interface controller. Now, in an iOS app, we call this the view controller. But in the case of the Apple Watch, they just want to be different. They, 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 they just cannot call it view controller. They call this interface controller. And if you want to populate this with some views or, or some controls, you can go to the object library here. And you can drag and drop a button. And you can drag and drop a label. So let me just stretch it up a little bit. 
Okay? And if you want to have more than one screen, you can always drag and drop interface controller, and then you can create your segways. So simple stuff. So let's keep it to one interface controller. And if you look at your extension, your extension has got an interface controller.swift. This is very much like your view controller.swift. And like I mentioned earlier on, your WatchKit extension contains code as well as your resources. So let's go in and write some simple code. So let's go to the Show Assistant Editor button. So let's fl split the screen. And let's create an outlet for this label. So control drag. Let's call it label, LBL, just for simplicity. And for the button, for the button, we want to create an action. So control click and create an action. And we want to say that this is button click. So we have an action here. So very much like your iOS programming, for those of you who are already familiar with. And if you want to display something in the label when you click on the button, you can simply do a self.lbl.set text. And you say hello. OK. So now, when you're done, if you look at the top here, you got two schemes available. The first is for your iPhone app. The second one is for your iPhone app plus your Apple Watch app. So I'm going to select the second one. And I'm going to run this. And your simulator should appear. So let me just uh, hide this a little bit. OK. OK, so this is your first Apple Watch application. So when you click on this button, you should see a hello there. Easy? Are you impressed? <coughs> OK, you, you don't look that impressed. OK, now let's take this chance to actually navigate this uh, Apple Watch simulator. So if I want to simulate going to the home screen, that means I want to press the digital crown. So you can do a command shift H. So you go to the uh, what we call watch face. So there are different types of watch faces available. So in on the simulator, you can actually simulate different types of uh, switch between different types of watch faces. So you can simulate a force touch so that you can actually customize the watch face. So to simulate that, Command Shift 2, when I click on that, that will simulate a force touch. And after that, if I want to simulate a normal touch, Command Shift 1, so I can switch between the different types of watch phases. So, so at this moment, I just want to, to get you acquainted with some of the watch phases. You have utility, you have modular. You have simple, motion, time lapse, astronomy, color, photo album, so on and so forth. And for example, if you decide to select this particular watch face, you can select this guy. And then it will show you the, the, the current time and, the, the, and have some animations to show you where is the location of the sun. So um, if you use your digital crown, you can actually turn this. And then look at the animation. So this is pretty cool. OK? You can do this all day. <laughs> so but anyway. OK? So OK, let, let's uh, switch to another watch face. So my, my favorite is this one. So. Now, this watch face has got a lot of information. So of course, the, this is a watch. So of course, you have the time, 4.14. And besides the time, you have what we call complications. If you look at the 
other uh, information that are being displayed. These are what we call complications. Okay, so let me go back to the slide, and then um, we will come back to this in a, in a moment. Okay, let's talk about complications. So what are complications? The name sounds really complicated. So now, by definition, a complication is basically a function on a timepiece that does more than just tell the time. If you look at this image here, how many complications are there? I think it's pretty obvious. If you look at the, the, the highlight in, in yellow, <laughs> how many are there? One, two, three, four, right? So this is, what is this? What, 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 what kind of data is this? Flight information. What about this? Date. What about this? I have no idea. What about this? This one looks familiar, right? Volkswagen. Probably it, it, it basically tells you about the diesel emission. But <laughs> anyway. Okay, I, I'm joking. So, anyway. Uh, now we have already looked at the various uh, watch faces. And now, let's say I want to change the complications that are being displayed on this watch face. What do I do? So I basically do a force touch, click on this guy, and I select customize. And I can actually customize the look and feel of this particular watch face. I can change the color. And if I swipe it to the right, I will be able to display and to change the different types of complication data. So at this moment, I have selected this particular complication. And what I can do is that I can use my digital crown, I can scroll, and I can change to different types of applications. So uh, by default, it has got sunrise, sunset, it has got weather, it has got the uh, stopwatch, so on and so forth. So what we are going to do later on is that we are going to write our own application to pump data to display onto the watch face. Okay, so there are different types of watch faces. So if you select this guy here, you can change this to display moon face, uh, display the stopwatch, so on and so forth. So this is how you customize your your complications. Now. What is important to you is, as a developer, think about the types of data that you want to display on the user's watch face. Okay, so think about that. What are the things that you can actually display? Now, before we talk about that, um, there are some watch faces that uh, do not support complications. Uh, they are motion, extra large, time lapse, astronomy, photo album, photo, and solar. They don't support complications. Now, the next feature that you have is what we call time travel. Time travel. Now, look at this example here, this two diagram. I have the weather complication here. It displays the current weather. And if I turn my digital crown, I will be able to display the weather forecast four hours from now. Okay, Now, if I turn it back the other direction, I may display the weather data that is past the current time. But, but most of the time, you're not interested in that. You are only, for weather forecast, you're only interested in the future. You don't care about what's the weather two hours ago, right? So this is what we call time travel. But there are a lot of uh, cases where you would want to display data that has already been, been is, is over, as well as events that are upcoming. Okay, so later on I'll show you one example. So time travel is something new in Watch OS 2.0, and the interesting thing is that as a developer you can actually write application to support time travel, and it lets you turn back time or fast forward. And some examples weather forecast so that you can actually display the weather forecast for the next two days if you want to. Stock prices. <laughs> the, 
that would be interesting. If you can display the stock prices of a particular stock two hours from now, you would have a killer app, and that's the end of today's presentation. <laughs> you don't have to talk further. Okay, so, but too bad, you, you cannot do that. But if somebody can actually write an algorithm to display the stock prices of a, of, of, of a particular stock uh, in, in the future, uh, give me a call. Okay, so. Now, uh, again, there are some watch faces not compatible with time travel. Uh, here are they, uh, on, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there are some watch phases that has got their own time travel. You cannot uh, program them, but it's already built in, like astronomy. So not too sure whether you have seen the demo on that. If you switch over to the... Okay, this is cool. So if you look at this, so you can actually spin the Earth. Not really spin the Earth, but you, you get what I mean. Okay, so you can you can look at the time, you can change the time, and you can see where 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 the sun is shining. Okay, now let's move on. Now, so as a developer, how do you actually support complications in your app? You make use of this framework known as the Clock Kit framework. And you simply need to implement the CLK complication data source protocol. So those of you who are familiar with the iOS development, uh, again, it's the usual protocol delegates design pattern. So you just need to acquaint yourself with this protocol. So you just need to implement this particular protocol, the methods inside this protocol. So let me just do a quick one. So you implement the following methods, get supported time travel directions. So you want to indicate whether you want the user to be able to fast forward or rewind. You can specify that programmatically. And what is the earliest start time that you want to display data? So when you rewind, what's the earliest date that you want to display? And when you fast forward, what is the latest date that you want to display? and whether you want your data to be displayed even if the watch is locked, such as when he removed his watch from his wrist. And you want to display your current data. And you also want to, uh, what are the data that you want to display for rewinding? So when you rewind to the previous time, what are the data, what are the entries you want to display? What are the data to display for future events? And how often do you update the data? And what do you actually display when the user selects your complication? So I'm going to show you a, a, a quick demo after this. Now, so before we look at the demos, these are the places where you can actually place your complication data. So for example, uh, in, in, in the current version, Apple supports five main types of complications placement. Uh, the first is the modular, uh, modular small, which is on the left-hand side. And then you have the modular large. You have the utilitarian small, large, as well as circular small. Now, the different placements here basically means that you can display different types of data. For example, you can display a ring if you want, or you can display two rows of text. So I have a, a slide to show you some examples. So in terms of the templates, these are the various templates that you can use to, dis to display your complication data on different parts of the watch face. And this is one example. So for example, if you selected complication template modular small columns text, so this is what you get. So in this case, you can display your data in two rows and two columns. So inside this particular placement template, you have four text fields for you to display your data. But if you think that this is not what you want, you can select another template, for example, called the modular small ring image, where you can display an image, and at the same time, you can display a ring. And a ring can either be 
closed style or open style. So for example, you want to display the rating of an item. So you can use this to represent uh, one full circle, 1.0. If you want to represent 0 0.75, you might have a three-quarter ring. So you have, can have open style or closed style. So they have one whole bunch of different templates available. You can refer to the documentation. They have one whole list of um, diagrams showing what types of placements you can have. So I'm going to show you one demo. So I am going to imagine that I am a movie operator. So my company plays movies so that I operate the cinema. So if you want to watch a particular movie, you can add my company's data onto your watch face. And when you are thinking of watching a movie, you can actually turn your digital crown and say, OK, um, 5 o'clock today, what movie is showing? And then you can turn 7 o'clock, what is the next movie? And if you want, you can always rewind and say, OK, today, 1 o'clock, what was the movie that was being played at the time? So a very simple uh, simulation here. I have an array of structures. And this structure represents the movie name, the movie running time, how many minutes, when it is going to, to play, and what is the rating. So to keep things simple, this diagram basically summarizes the movies that are playing in the future and those movies that have already been played uh, for the past few hours. So this is the current time. And when I run my application, I'm going to say that uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to play this movie called Secondhand Lions. And then two hours later, I'm going to play this the Dark, the Dark Knight, so and so forth. And when I run that demo, you can see that as you scroll through the digital crown, you'll be able to see all these different movies displayed on your watch face. OK, so let's do a quick one. So let's load this project. OK, so movies. OK. OK, let's run it. OK, now, first thing first, I got to change my watch face to one that supports complication. So I'm going to go back to my modular, select this guy customize it, change this to my complication. So I'm going to run through that, and this would be my complication. So by default, I display the current time. I display the text movie name running time. So once I have selected that, I am also going to select another place where I can display another complication from my application. Now, in this application, I'm going to support two different placements. One is the modular large, and one is in the um, modular small. So if I run through this, I'll be able to see this thing called Movies Watch Kit app. And in this case, I display a circle followed by a, the R for rating. What is the rating of this, uh, this movie? Once I'm done with that, select this guy. So. This is the current movie that is playing. If you look at the diagram that you saw earlier on, so the current time is this movie. And I am going to scroll through this. I'm going to use my digital crown. Scroll through this, and as you, oops, as you as you rewind, you'll be seeing the movies that have played previously, and if you go forward, you will see the movies that are going to play in the next few hours. Okay, and also notice that at the bottom, as you scroll, the rating will change together with the movie name that is going to be played. So if you 
If you change this, you will see that sometimes nine, sometimes eight. So that depends on the movie that's going to play. Okay, so that is complication data. So let's move, move on. The next important thing that you can develop is uh, using this thing called the WatchKit connectivity framework. Now, a quick recall. If you look at the diagram that you have seen earlier on, your iPhone application is on the iPhone, and your Apple Watch application is on the Apple Watch. But a lot of times, you want to communicate with your Apple Watch. How do you actually do that? Now, in version 1.0, things are very simple, because this guy is here. And you can directly call this iOS app without major problem. But in 2.0, you have a problem. Both are on different islands. So how do you so solve that? You make use of this framework known as the watch, kit, uh, the watch connectivity framework. So the watch connectivity framework supports two types of communication, background communication as well as live communication. Now, for background communications, you have three different modes. Application contacts, user info, file transfer. For the interactive messaging, you have send message. So what are all these different methods doing? Let me show you. So first thing, let's talk about background transfer. And it has got this mode known as application contacts. Now, look at this diagram. It is communicating from the phone to the Apple Watch. Now, for simplicity, I'm showing you this in one direction. But the reverse is also true. You can also communicate from the Apple Watch to the iPhone. So let's imagine that I'm trying to send three dictionaries, A, B, C. So since this is a background transfer, when I, trans when I send the data, the first dictionary over to this side, this Apple Watch application need not be running. So if this application is not running, it will buffer this dictionary, A. And then at the same time, I send B. When I send B, since the A is still waiting, B will overwrite A. And if I send C, C will come here, look at B, overwrite B. So in this case, your Apple Watch will always receive the latest dictionary sent by your iPhone. So this is what we call application context. Now, what are the UK use cases? So this is very useful for updating your application state. So for example, you are writing a weather application. You want to display the latest weather onto the glances. So in this case, the user is only interested in the most recent weather information. So in this case, you can use the application context method. Next one, background transfers. If you look at this diagram, it is pretty obvious. So when I send A, B, C, A, B, C would all be queued up here. So it will not collapse. So when the Apple Watch application comes to the foreground, it will receive the data in the order that it was sent from the iPhone. So this is user info. So what's the use case for this? Useful for games where changes on one device must be synchronized on the other device, okay? where you cannot afford to, to lose a, a single piece of information. Third one, uh, file transfer. And that is when you want to transfer data other than dictionary. You want to transfer images, for example. So in this case, you send your image together with an optional dictionary. It sends over. It is queued up and buffered. And when the application comes to the foreground, it is pushed to the application. So the three pass methods are all based on background transfer. The last one, um, talk about use, sorry, the use case for, for this particular file transfer is when you want to send images uh, between devices. Just ignore this diagram. It looks really scary. OK, now the last one, uh, interactive communications. So in this diagram, my iPhone wants to send a message to my Apple Watch. And at the same time, 
once I have sent the data to the Apple Watch, I want a reply from the Apple Watch, and the Apple Watch would be able to give me a reply. Okay. Likewise, on the Apple Watch, I can also send a request to the iPhone, get the iPhone to process it, return me the data that I want, pass it back to me. So this mode is more exciting. Why? These are the two scenarios that can happen. When the Apple Watch sends a message to the iPhone, and if your iPhone app is in the background or it is not even executing, it will automatically execute your app, your iPhone app in the background. And you can actually do a lot of interesting things like home automation, stuff like this. But when the reverse happens, if the iPhone sends a message to the watch and the watch app is not running, the communication will just fail. Okay? So in this case, you see that the Apple Watch has got higher priority. So what are the things that you can develop? For example, you can use your watch and say, hey, Siri. And then you can say, launch my app. And when they launch your app, your, your app will be in the foreground. You touch a button, unlock my garage door. So the command would be sent to the uh, watch, uh, to your phone, and your phone would connect to your home automation network, and you can unlock your garage door. So these are the things that you can, you can think of. Okay. So this is the, one of the use cases. Show you Now, uh, I'm not able to show you this demo, because when I connect this to my, to my PC, you're not able to see the, the volume control. But I have written a very simple example where you can actually deploy this application onto your phone as well as your Apple Watch. And you can control your volume on your, on your Apple Watch. So if you click on a plus, the volume here will increase. OK? So um, if you want to download the source code, it's available in, in, in the link earlier on. You can download and have fun. Uh, I have one demo that I want to show to you. I, I, I hope I have time. Do I have time? Three minutes. Three minutes? Okay, so communications. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you that I, I'm going to send some data from my watch to my phone. And I'm going to show you the different methods that you can have so that you can see for yourself. Now, I'm going to show you the application context. Remember, if I send three dictionaries, what would be received on the target? If I send three dictionaries, only the last dictionary would be received, right? So let me show you this. If I click this application context three times, one, two, three, and then I launch my application, it will display this once. Okay. Now, let, let me prove to you that I'm not, not lying to you. If I click on this, you will get the data. If I click on this, you will get the data. Okay. So let's, uh, oops, let me just, let me just queue this. Okay, this app is queued. Okay, that's good. So the second method, user info. So if I click this two times or three times, that three dictionaries would be buffered and delivered to this guy. So one, two, three. Not too sure whether I click two, two, two times or three times, but I'm going to launch this three times. OK. Now, so let's queue this guy. And I'm going to do a file transfer. So I'm going to send a dictionary together with an image over to this guy. So I click once, file transfer. If I click on the communications app, I'll get the image that was being sent over. OK? And the last one, I can click on the send message. If I click send, what I did was 
I actually print this out in the output window to, to prove to you that when I send a message over to the phone, the phone actually replies me with some data. And if I were to launch this app, bring this up, you'll be able to see the data that was sent over to that phone. Okay, so because this is a, a, a 15 minute session, it's really quite, quite difficult to see everything in, in, in full details, but hopefully that gives you a, a good flavor of how to communicate between your watch app and your iOS app. Okay, and the sample code for this one is again available for download. So download this, use this as a template, you'll be able to send data between the two devices. Okay, so I think I have one final slide. Okay, so what are some of the suggestions to, to develop your killer watch apps? Uh, first thing first, I know you have a lot of mobile apps, uh, but don't cram all the UI in your mobile apps onto the watch, okay? Because that's not gonna work. So think of the watch as an extension of your phone and use it to enhance the experience of your mobile app. So home automation, like I mentioned earlier, is a very good candidate for your Apple Watch. So things like you can actually unlock your, your garage door very easily using, using uh, Siri and then you can press the button talk to your phone, your phone activates your home automation project, so on and so forth. Okay, so, okay, so I think I am almost at the end. So, question. Well, I don't think actually there's, there's enough time for questions right now. Okay. But, um, but I'm sure that uh, probably you will answer questions up here uh, afterwards or something, but sure. time's up. So, uh, thank you very much, Wei, and uh, please give him a hand. Thank you.